Okay, so here we're going to look at a classic result in elementary number theory known as the division algorithm. So it states that for all integers a and b, where, a, where b is positive, there exists unique q and r, also integers, such that a equals b times q plus r, where r is between 0 and b but does not include b. So in this setup, we would say q is the quotient and r is the remainder. So before we get to the proof, let's look at some examples. So let's start off with a equals 21 and b equals 2. So in this case we can see that a, which is 21, equals 2 times 10 plus 1. So our q value is 10 and our r value is 1. And so r is between 0 and 2 as needed. Okay, let's look at another one. Let's say a equals 35 and b equals 6. Okay, good. So in this case, we can write 35 as 6 times 5 plus 5. And so in this case, our quotient is 5 and our remainder is also 5. And the remainder lies between 0 and 6 but does not include 6. Okay, good. So now that we've seen some examples, I'll clean up the board and we can look at the proof in general. Okay, so now we're ready to look at the proof. So, an important component of this proof is a certain set. So let's consider the following set, so I'll call it S, and it's made up of all numbers of the form A minus B times X, where X runs over all integers as long as a minus bx is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, good. So this set is really important for this proof. So before we move on with the proof in general, let's look at one of these sets. So let's say in this case, a equals 12 and b equals 5. Okay, good. So We've got different values of x that we can take, and then we want to look at uh, elements of the form 12 minus 5x. Okay, great. So let's say if x equals 0, we have 12 minus 0, so we have 12. So if x equals 1, we have 12 minus 5, so we have 7. If x equals 2, we have 12 minus 10, so we have 2. If x equals 3, we have 12 minus 15, so that's negative 3. And notice if we plug in anything bigger than 3, we'll get numbers that are more negative. So that means everything in this direction is not in S because it doesn't satisfy this second condition that A minus BX is bigger than or equal to 0. But we can plug in negative values of x. So if we plug in negative 1, we get 12 plus 5, which is 17. If we plug negative 2 in there, we get 22, and so on and so forth. So everything in this direction is an element of s. So this gives us a good feel for what s is in this case. So in this case, s is 2, 7, 12, 17, and so on and so forth. So just as a hint as to what's coming, notice that 2 is in fact the remainder in this case, and the corresponding x value, which is also 2, is the quotient. And that's because we can write 12 equals 5 times 2 plus 2. So that's how this proof will work with arbitrary a and b. So I'll clean up the board and we'll see how that goes. Okay, so as we saw in the example, it may be important to look at the smallest element from this set S. So we have to argue why there is a smallest. So notice that this set is only made up of non-negative numbers. So it will have a smallest element given that it is non-empty. So that's one thing that we have to prove. So let's claim that S is not the empty set. So if, the empty set, if it's the empty set, obviously there are no elements, so there can be no minimum element. But as long as it's not the empty set, we can get a minimum element. So in this case, we need to look at two different cases. So case number one will be if a is bigger than or equal to zero. 
So if a is bigger than or equal to zero, we'll set x equal to zero, and we'll see that a minus b times zero equals a, which is an element of s. So we have found an element of s. It is, in fact, a. And in this case, we know that s is non-empty. OK, so let's get, look at case number two, which will be a is less than 0. So now we've got to choose a value for x that guarantees an element in the set. So we can't choose x equals 0 anymore, but what we will do is set x equal to the number a itself. So let's see what we get if we do that. We get a minus b times a. So a minus bx. So we can factor an a out of that, and we get a times 1 minus b. Now look at this. We have a product of two numbers. We know that a itself is less than 0. And then we know that b is bigger than 0. So it's bigger than or equal to 1, which means that this part of the product is less than or equal to 0. So if we're multiplying a number that's less than 0 with a number that's less than or equal to 0, we know this whole thing is bigger than or equal to 0, which means a minus b times a is an element of s. OK, good. So since s is non-empty, we can take a minimum element of it. And so let's let r equal the minimum element of s. OK, so I'll clean up the board and we'll continue. But let's look at where we need to go. We next need to show that r is, in fact, between 0 and b. And then we need to show that um, this q and r are unique. And I should say here, and uh, q is the corresponding so the corresponding x value. So we know every value in the set comes with a corresponding x value. So for this value r, we'll take that to be q. OK, good. So I'll clean up the board, and then we'll get going. OK, as we finished with the last time, we said let's let r be the minimum value of s, and let's let q be the corresponding x value. So in that case, we have a, sorry, sorry, we have b, sorry, we have r equals a minus b times q, which can be easily rewritten as a equals b q plus r as needed. So now we need to show that r is in the acceptable range. So, and we'll do that by contradiction. So towards a contradiction, Let's suppose that r is bigger than or equal to b. OK, good. So that gives us r is equal to a minus bq, which is bigger than or equal to b. And now we can subtract b from both sides of this inequality. So that gives us r minus b is equal to a minus b times q plus 1, which is bigger than or equal to b minus b, which is 0. So what does that tell us? That tells us that r minus b is an element of s, but r minus b is less than r. So we have found an element of s which is smaller than the minimum element of s, and that's our contradiction. OK, so just to have a brief summary, we have a value of q and a value of r that satisfy this equation and this inequality. So all that's left to prove is that these numbers are unique. So now we'll go ahead and prove the uniqueness of these numbers q and r. So let's suppose that q, q prime and r, r prime are 
such that A equals B Q plus R, which equals B Q prime plus R prime. In other words, we have two pairs of numbers that satisfy the given conclusion of the division algorithm. And we want to show that these pairs of numbers are actually equal. Okay, good. So let's see. We have B Q plus R equals B Q prime plus R prime. And before we get going, we can assume without loss of generality, we'll assume that R prime is bigger than or equal to R. So if we have two numbers R and R prime, they're either equal or one is larger. And so we can just assume that they go in this order. Okay, good. So now we can take this equation and rearrange it so the quotients are on one side and the remainders are on the other side. So that, that'll give us BQ minus BQ prime equals R prime minus R. And now we can factor a B out of the left hand side and we'll get the following. So now we'll notice this, that the left hand side is a multiple of B and then we'll also notice that the right hand side because R prime and R both satisfy this inequality and R prime is bigger, we know that the right hand side is between 0 and B. So now putting both of those things together, we see that the only possibility is that the left hand side which equals the right hand side is equal to zero because the only multiple of B that's between zero and B but doesn't include B is zero itself. But that immediately gives us R equals R prime because we know R prime minus R equals zero and then we know this left hand side is also equal to zero. So B is bigger than zero which means that Q equals Q prime, which finishes the proof of uniqueness of these two numbers Q and R, and in fact finishes the proof of the entire division algorithm.